So the topic today is to con the second one on or called ready to give an answer and the term apologetics and often this sometimes is connected or this is for intellectuals. Well, if that was true, then I certainly would not be one who would be at all qualified to talk about it. But maybe the idea is to look together at some basic principles of this, some of the things that are being faced by believers. Um, the topic is is something that it's important to understand. Uh, it's not apologetics that produces faith. It's the spirit of God working by the word of God in a heart. But it also, on the other side, is a topic that uh, properly handled can remove barriers to faith. People often start out and they've been told that the word of God is not, not true, that also a whole bunch of different false things about origin of life, of the universe, um, the accuracy of the Bible, the resurrection. So when we, we go back and look at it, we, we can see why there is the evidence for what we believe. We respond by faith. And so it's a, it's a thing that there's a verse, uh, there's a word, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it in Greek, but apologia or something. Speaking in defense is what it means. And that word actually appears eight times in the New Testament. And so the verses are on the screen and I've left this before in Bible talks, the, the presentation, but the word in, um, in, I, in bold is actually how it's translated in each of these cases. And so I'll read each of them because that's really the most important what's in the word of God far more than what I would say. Acts 21, one men, brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I make now unto you. So most of these references were actually things that the apostle Paul said. Acts 25, 16, to whom I answered, it is not the manner of Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself. Apologia concerning the crime laid against him. First Corinthians 9, 3, mine answer to them that do examine me is this. And so we see different ways that this word is translated. Second Corinthians 7, 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye which sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, another way of translating it that's interesting, yea, what indignation, indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things you've approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. And in Philippians 1, 7, but even as meet for me to think of this of you all, because I have you in my heart in as much as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. You're all partakers of my grace. Philippians 1, 7. It reminds, brings to mind when you see this verse, someone said many years ago to me, uh, you don't have to defend a lion, you just have to let him out and he's able to defend himself. And so the power there is in the word of God, and that's maybe the last slide we'll see today if we're left here was one of the most interesting occasions that I've ever had in my life, I'll explain a little history, that the word of God is living and powerful and we have to let it out and it, it's able to defend itself. Philippians 1, 15 to 17, some indeed preach Christ even of envy and strife and some of goodwill. This one preached Christ of contention, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds, but the other of love knowing that I'm set for what? For the defense speaking in defense of the gospel. So it's certainly something that we are instructed multiple times that we can do and should do. Here's the one example that came from Peter, 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope which is in you with meekness and fear. I'll translate another translation with gentleness and respect. It's interesting that verse, um, I think is a verse that can be very important where a sister may say, well, I'm not going out to teach, but the word of God does not limit giving an answer of the hope that's in us to each one in the proper circumstances. Second Timothy 4.16, that my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. And so we see this word, the basis of what this subject eight times in the New Testament. Well, one of the things that sometimes is important is to listen to someone, to listen to their arguments, because someone may say, well, I don't have this problem. I don't have that question. But 
these are the kind of comments and these are things I took off of listening to some talks of actually atheists, agnostics. Uh, some of them got together in their group of very four famous ones. And, and most of these are topics that, uh, the statements that they made. Well, if we can understand what someone is saying, if we listen to them, that's the first part of often being able to respond to it. And we realize that someone, young people, students, et cetera, may be facing these kind of things from professors, from fellow students, from different sources. It's important to understand what they're saying. One of them, the first is religion is held off the table of rational criticism. In other words, if you say this is religious, you can't even really properly evaluate it. That's a, a false statement. Everything should be open and, and subject to evaluation. Um, the, this group of atheists said, there's a spell and we, we've got to break it. We have to understand that we're living in, in the time of Ephesians chapter six, uh, battles against spiritual wickedness in high places. And they consider that those of us who know the Lord Jesus are under a spell and their job is to try to break it. Thankfully, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And so then they say, well, what we say offends the core of any religious person, that they realize that, oh, this attack is going against those of us who they would consider religious. And then you see the boldness of this statement. There's no polite way to say you've wasted all your life to the glorification of Sunday, which is a myth. Their consideration is that what we believe is nothing more than a myth, nothing that has a, any basis at all. Well, we know from the word of God and even looking at what's around us that that's not true. It's not a myth, it's true. What they believe is a myth, but it's the reality of what we're facing. And then they, then it's interesting because one of, the most famous, one of the most famous atheists says there's three alternatives about God. One is that there are many and all are true. Number two says none are true. The third says only one is true. Well, we believe number three. And an experienced thought, atheist who's thought out things would be the first to admit that number one is false because of what they would, what would be called mutual exclusivity because they don't lead, they don't have the same teachings. And so an atheist would say, well, none are, or only one is true. And what they believe is none are true. At least that's what they profess to believe. We know that number three is one is true, but we have the one eternal God in, in Trinity and divinity, Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit is what is true, but that's the battle that's going on. And then there are others who say it is only those who are certain that we have to distrust. Well, it's interesting that if you go back and look, uh, Francis Schaeffer the, with the Lord, and someone who was very useful in apologetics, he wasn't clear on church truth and things from the Presbyterian background, but apologetics he was, um, he pointed out that in Europe, many, many decades ago, and later it spread to North America, um, that the whole concept that you can't be certain about something. And they would consider, and many do consider today, that we're preposterous to try to say that we're certain about something. And then the, the last is the deist, and this is not the last, but just some of this collection of things that I wrote down from listening to some of the things they say as an infinite source of faith. In other words, they're recognizing that they've run up against people that no matter what they say, no matter what they do to try to tear down their beliefs, their arguments, there is nothing that dents their faith. Well, hopefully that's true for each one of us. Uh, it's not a negative thing. On the other side, an apologist, these are some of the things that are actually the basis to be able to respond. One of them is complementary explanations. Um, we can... We, those of us who maybe in one way or another, for instance, work in science, in certain things to a degree, we may be able to explain how it works. And yet at the same time, we have the marvelous knowledge of knowing why it exists. It's interesting, the things, if you're someone's interested in science to see the things in creation, we can see things about how it works, how it, maybe it's a plant, an animal, uh, the, the cycles of water of different elements, uh, how, how uh, earthquakes and volcanoes function, why volcanoes are important to replace what's been lost by, by um, um, 
the last when you material is carried down river and things but and so we can see it but the source of of it we also know that's a marvelous thing one of the statements that one made as telescopes show us the wonder of the stars in the night sky but they don't put them there and so we can go back and say i know what the source of this is um it's very interesting astronomy the big bang theory uh, they acknowledge that based on that, it leads to a unique event to the origin of the universe, of the material in the universe. And they say, well, that all the material in the universe was something that came in basically the size of a dot. It was created out of nothing. Well, they recognize that we recognize that what it was was the creator proclaimed into existence the universe and from infinite infinite power and so it's interesting sometimes to to be like it says in, in athens the, the unknown god we can explain what the source of that was why it was at one point one time one measure another thing is the apologist can say okay you can measure the speed of light that's one thing and it and people can to create light is another it doesn't come out of the nothing and it's interesting to find that so many times now people are, are saying, oh, if that person's a creationist, if they believe in that, they're no good as a scientist. Well, it's interesting that as more and more things come to light, there are an increasing number of real well-known respected scientists that believe in the creator because they see the evidence. We recognize too that the universe is intelligible. It's not a chaotic uh, place. Chaos has been introduced by sin, but then also science is important. It has its usage, but it has its limitations. It, it cannot answer why am I here? So we see the contrasting views between an, an apologist and an atheist. And there is some things that, have, that are common terms maybe that's worth understanding today. There's what is called new atheism. Now I just will read the definition I pulled out of Wikipedia. Online, the, the modern day atheism is advanced by a group of thinkers and writers who advocate the view that superstition, religion, and irrationalism should simply not be tolerated, but should be countered, criticized, and challenged by rational argument wherever they exert undue influence, such as in government, education, and politics. And so it's not a neutral thing. New atheism says we're going to do battle. And Ephesians chapter six says we are in a battle. Uh, that we we need to know how to and i think it's i'll just stop and read the verse i think it's important one of the verses but in ephesians chapter six find it quickly in my bible um ephesians chapter six um for we that's why we put on the armor of god for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities against powers against the ruler of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We read in the Old Testament that they had physical battles. Our battle normally for most of us in the world is much more spiritual. And we do have a spiritual battle against new atheism. People who are dedicated, they're committed to try to tear down what is presented, the truth that's, that is the word of God. And so that's one of the things we face. Another thing that's faced, another group of people is what's called postmodernism. And rather than try to put in my own words again, this is out of Wikipedia. Postmodernism said there's no real truth. I mentioned before that everything is, is fuzzy, gray areas. It says that knowledge is always made or invented and not discovered because knowledge is made by people. A person cannot know something with certainty. All ideas and facts are believed instead of known. People believe that they know what the truth is, but they will think the truth is something different later. This is the opposite of objectivity, which says that the truth is always there. People have to discover it. Since postmodernism says that the truth is just a thing that people invent, people can believe different things and think it is the truth and all be right. Postmodernism says that one person should not try to make another person believe what he believes because it means nothing to say that one belief is right and another is wrong. Postmodernism says that if someone has a belief and tries to make someone else believe it, also 
it means they are just trying to have power over them. And that's a reality, maybe it's a, it's a greater reality for more people than the new atheism. Um, a lot of people say, I'll tolerate it. You have your belief, I have my belief, but you know, let's, as they say, don't talk about politics and religion. Um, the, the objection and the people getting into trouble for sharing their faith in the Lord Jesus. And so we realize that when we're going to defend what we know is true, the truth, the word of God, which is the truth, not just contains the truth, it is the truth, that we're going to be running against these type of currents. Um, another thing that's important to understand, a lot of people say, well, it, all that matters is you have faith. Well, the Muslim in the picture on the left, the Hindu in the second picture, the Jews in the third picture, and the, the, the Buddhist in the right picture, they all have faith but it's not properly placed. The only one that's in a sense close is because they stopped at the Old Testament of the Jews, but they have not recognized in most cases that the one who came, our blessed savior, is the Messiah, their Messiah. And so we don't deny that those people have faith. What we recognize is that their faith is not properly placed, it's misplaced. And so, the question is on some things, can you test it by the scientific method? Well, scientific method, you do a question, you, you do the research, now you can do it in Google or on different things on source and, and do it. You construct a hypothesis, you test it with an exper experiment, you see if the experiment works and then you analyze and you go back and it's a loop. Well, scientific method is a, a useful thing for a lot of things, but it doesn't do any good with the scientific method to say, okay, now we're gonna see if we can create a new universe. No one's been able to do it. I'll stop here and say, maybe it's a topic for another time, but it's quite interesting that there has never been in any laboratory, in any outside of a laboratory, one single functioning cell that has been made. You can't imagine the amount of millions, billions of dollars that people have tried to say, we're gonna make a cell. And oh, it, it happened in some primordial soup and under these conditions and those sort of things. It's a topic maybe for another time. And not even come close to making one cell, one functioning cell. And so to say this just happened out of the nothing, well, they've tried the scientific method and they failed in every time. There is no such thing as a simple cell. Even Bill Gates recognized that DNA was more complicated than, than any of the programs that they would come up with with Microsoft or or other uh, programmers. It is a above and beyond what the marvel, the creation that is made through the eternal Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'm not going to go into all this, but I want to say, you know, science gives us constants. We depend upon that. And so uh, we recognize what it is. And, and if someone were to look at these things, no, I've never in any science class or anything since had anyone question what the things of the speed of light, they will not question that there's a difference in the size, the mass of a proton or a neutron or electron, none of that. And if you want, try to tell me that those things have appeared out of just an explosion and you have all the, the periodic chart of over hundred elements and you have the right number of orbitals and all these sort of things and all these subatomic particles and there's those that are even smaller, they're all the same mass. As my father used to say, it would take more faith to believe that that was an accident than to believe in God. And so God in this perfect way has made, has made the creation such a marvelous thing. You can, it's more interesting. It's interesting, for instance, that water is more dense at one degree Celsius than minus one degree Celsius. Very important. Otherwise, in the middle of winter, in a cold winter, the fish would be the, the most dense. The ice would go down and all the fish and everything underneath the water would pop out on the surface. And so God has made all these details in a way that shows the hand of the creator. And so we can say, yes, we can use science to study these things, to appreciate these things. But in the end, we recognize that it gives us constants, things that are there, but the fact that those are constants does not mean that it just arose out of nothing. And so the question comes and, and this is an important one, can we apply the scientific method to prove the existence of God? And no, what's from the past eternity, supernatural and divine cannot be proven or disproven by the scientific method. People make science as a God. There's a term called sciencism, which basically says, 
science becomes the religion of some people. And so you can test any of the other explanations for the origin of the universe. None of them can be proven by the scientific method unless someone could all of a sudden in a total vacuum make a new universe. Well, we have the evidence from the word of God, the Bible and by faith to believe it. The evidence though that we see is consistent with the word of God. A, an important thing that was said to me many years ago is if there's a disagreement between what science is teaching at any one time and what the Bible says, oh, wait, science will have to come around to what the truth is because the truth is what is in the word of God. And so something that's important, and this is, this is the question that's, that's very basic is um, people struggle with thinking about something that does not have a beginning. For me, it's easier to grasp a future eternity. Uh, in a sense, we can wrap our brains around that, even though it goes beyond what we can grasp very well. But the marvel of it is in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. God, the Godhead is eternal. No beginning in the past. I can't, I can't grasp that, but by faith, I can marvel and enjoy that. And so one of the things that people really struggle with is they say, well, which is the chicken and which is the egg? If there's, there's a God, which was first, the God of the creation? And it's very clear. What is eternal does not have a beginning. God is eternal. Everything after that has a cause. We recognize where it comes from. And so John 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And then Proverbs 8, 22, 31, which enjoyed many times a hymn that's based on this. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way. Before his works of old, I was set up from everlasting and from the beginning or ever the worth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Well, as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree, that the work, water, should not pass his commandment. When he appointed the foundation of the earth, and I was by him as one brought up with him. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth. My delights were with the sons of men. It's our response to when someone who says, if there's a God who made him, no one made him. He's eternal. It's from the past eternity. And so the first verse chronologically in the Bible is not Genesis 1.1. It's John 1.1. In the beginning already was the word. It's, it's, it's just a marvelous thing, something that goes beyond what our minds can grasp to think that an eternal God says, I'm going to love a sinner such as me, and I'm going to send my son to pay the price to redeem him. Well, what is a, in the beginning? Has a beginning, has a cause. What from, is from eternity does not have a cause. And so you read that, that their explanations about the matter, and they say, well, maybe it came from another universe or everything. If you don't acknowledge the existence of the eternal Godhead, people run into a wall and they can't explain things. But we, by faith, know it's true. Understand it completely? No. Marvel in it? Absolutely. So there's different spiritual um, presuppositions, ways of looking at things that people have. There are those who they, they call philosophical naturalism or materialism. They say that only natural laws and forces operate in the world and they can explain every phenomena. All that is only the relationships between material objects and natural forces. Supernatural forces are not considered as an option. And uh, some have said, well, science is skewed to ignore any supernatural explanation, even when the evidence might indicate that natural material explanations are lacking. And so someone, some have their minds closed to the fact that there can be the supernatural. Everything they say has to be explained by natural forces. Well, you can explain by natural thing, the body, uh, certain things, not marvel in what it is, but, but you can explain the processes. A doctor who studies that he or she will understand far better than those of us who are not. 
Some of us may work with plants or animals or whatever. Um, but one of the things that these things don't even begin to explain are things like emotions, love, uh, jealousy, whatever. They're, they're not explainable by saying, well, I can analyze this segment of DNA and this explains certain things. Yeah, more and more, you, the, this, the code, genetic codes are, are open, revealed. You can say, well, a certain segment it does this thing, makes this protein, or it's a control mechanism for, for proteins or other things. But it can't explain emotions. Um, but they try to limit it to that. Very limiting, very wrong. Others, the mental roadblocks that uh, say, well, I've already made my mind up and, and so I'm going to ignore the questions and everything is going to force back to what I believe. And they run, um, they say anything that's contrary to, to what the person believes, they're, they're not going to accept. And so they, they say, well, you Christians, you have faith no matter what the evidence seems to show. Well, say if, if we don't understand the evidence, we have to wait until the evidence aligns with the word of God, our understanding of it. Um, but it's, we trust that it's not for us mental roadblocks. It's the openness to, to accept what the word of God says, what God teaches by his spirit through his word. Another thing is that they say, well, Christians are biased because we believe in the supernatural. We're, we're arrogant over, uh, we're prejudiced and everything else. We well, everyone has their worldview. Everyone has their way of, of saying things. And they say, well, if it, it cannot be tested by the five senses, it does not exist. Well, I think we talked before about you know, the person who, uh, the student, and I'm not saying to do this, but maybe I'll repeat the history of the student who was in a class and, and the professor was denying, um, denying what we believe and, uh, and, Question came up between the student and the professor. To the, the professor, do you have a brain? And the brain, the professor said, "Of course I do." And the student says, "Have you seen it? No, I haven't seen it. Have you touched it? No. Have you tasted it? No. Have you heard it? No. Have you know?" And went through all the five senses. And so the, the student evidently said to the professor, "Do you have a brain?" Well, we, people, we all act by things that go beyond our five senses, but that's the barrier for certain people. So they don't distinguish between science, which is how you systematically, rationally examine the things going on around and, and scientism, where you make science a religion, you refuse to accept that there can be the supernatural. What is God? Carl Sagan says the universe is all there is or, or was or ever will be. Well, if that's true, if the universe is eternal, and we recognize that the universe is expanding. Well, things would be so far apart now. There would uh, the the, you know, the effects of gravity and things would be we overcome. Think about a person like that, and you say he's in eternity. What is he saying now? Now he's faced with reality. He's faced with it. Well, it's important that we be, in a sense, defending our faith, presenting the Lord Jesus Christ as the only Savior of sinners, because when someone goes into eternity, eternity is forever. An eternity without Christ, I cannot imagine what it is. On the other hand, we think about what eternity is with God our Father, with the Lord Jesus Christ. I was thinking of our sister Miriam yesterday. Yeah, you know, body was left in in a in a uh, casket in the grave, but imagine what she's enjoyed in this very brief period of time now that she's home, spirit and soul, in the glory, unmatched. Well, by God's grace. He's worked in our hearts that should produce worship and thanks and praise. And so how can we evaluate the evidence? And if it can't be evaluated by the scientific method, um, it can be evaluated by inferences. This means really to gather in information. And, and so in logic and inferences, when you, when, when the thinking process from, from information to see what is true, it consists of statements and those statements, um, we evaluate them to find what is the most rational, the most reasonable explanation of things. Um, and so you, people can speculate, but when we examine the evidence, the evidence certainly points to, to a creator, to, to God. We don't find out from what we look around his name, but in Romans 1, it was clear that someone could come to that conclusion from Romans 1, the word of God is teaches us about him. 
the eternal Godhead can be seen from what's around. And so uh, one of the books that's quite interesting, the different things written by a person called J. Warner Wallace, interesting man one time and when Bob and I were at uh, Expolite, the Spanish Christian booksellers thing in, in Miami, he gave a, a talk in one of the rooms and went and listened to it. He was a, a homicide detective in the Los Angeles police force. And so he learned very clearly how to, how to examine evidence. And he said, well, these are some of the things, you know, the truth must be feasible. It, you can, it's something that you can explain uh, when they would go through the evidence. The truth should be straightforward. It, 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 it shouldn't have to lead you around everything. It should be exhausting. It, it could explain in depth the conclusions that it came to. It should be logical. It should be superior. And so uh, an example, when you look at the creation, I was just looking at one of our dogs the other day and I was thinking, boy, if this was just an accident and see, see how the dog leg, back legs of a dog bend in a different way than the legs of a human, when I can see what one of our dogs can, how high she can jump uh, compared with her height, I say, okay, that was a different design. Have you ever seen a dog bow their knees and get on their, yeah, they'll, they'll stand on their back haunches, but they can't. Well, all of those things aren't just an accident. That's the evidence of, of a designer. The Bible tells us who the designer is. All things were made by him, without him was not anything made that was made. And so what are the types of evidence? Well, J. Warner Wallace and others have said, you know, there's a direct evidence, evidence that can prove something all by itself. Well, 1 Corinthians 15, 4 to 8, and he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And he was seen of Cephas, then of the 12. After that, he was seen of 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of James, then out of all, then of all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen of me also. Paul taken up to the third heaven as one born out of due time. That was direct evidence. There were, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Well, there were way more than two or three witnesses of his resurrection. That's direct evidence. And so that, that is what can be, could, could be used to examine a lot of things and, and is. And we have that in the word of God. I remember when this man spoke in the small group that was listening to him that Saturday morning. He said that... Uh, one of the things that he as a homicide detective could do in the end is they found that if there was more than one person involved, that it was much easier to break because when there were two people involved in the end, one would tell a rat against the other one. And well, this wasn't limited to two witnesses. This was limited to 500 and more, more brethren. And when we see how the apostles reacted after, we know what happened to to Judas, 10 of them were historically say they were martyrs. Paul was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. They wouldn't have gone through what they went through if it wasn't false, but they saw the risen savior. And then they knew that he ascended the glory. So there's direct evidence, but there's also circumstantial evidence, evidence that um, it, it, it heads in the right direction. The things, if I can put it that way, add up. Example is anything that begins to exist has a cause, as we've seen before. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause, and its cause must be eternal and uncaused. And the only rational explanation is that an all-powerful, all-wise uh, God made it, and in, in, uh, who was before space, time, and reason. And so we have to understand that those things are reasonable. We, we, we can't go back. No one can go back and reconstruct it. But the account in the word of God is the only thing that fits to explain what we see around us. And so even the example, the normal causes of death, you know, we reckon they would, he would say as a murder detective, he said, you get natural, de natural death, sickness, rage, accidental death. Someone is involved in an auto accident, a fall or whatever, suicide or, or murder. And so when they would go through things, they would analyze to say, well, what was the cause of death in this case? Here's an example that goes beyond this. It's happened once and only once. Revealed by the scriptures and it's the son of God. John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. 
this commandment have I received of my father. Yeah, we hear of someone giving up. Um, I, I remember my mother-in-law, who I will meet for the first time when we're in the glory because she died of cancer, Debbie's mother, when she was only 49 years old. And they explained how the nurse that was attending, maybe like we would have hospice care now, said, sort of let her go, don't call her back. Well, um, she, she went peacefully and is with the Lord and certainly looking forward to the meeting her in the glory. Um, but the Lord Jesus is the one that they could never take his life from. He had to give it up. He had to give it. Guilty, yes, but capable of taking his life, no. When Jesus cried in Luke 23, 46, and 47, when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. And when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God, saying, certainly, this was a righteous man. And yes, we recognize those who were there directly responsible, me because of my sins, were guilty of his death, but he was the only one who had total power and could give his life. No one could take it from him. Well, we recognize that this is the one, the creator, God's eternal son, that, um, that we are called to, in a sense, be apologists to defend. I was thinking yesterday and connected to the funeral of our sister Miriam. There's no greater defense than a life lived that shows the reality of what we believe. Um, there is the opportunity in many cases to, to speak, to show it verbally, but our sister spoke and showed it verbally, but the greatest evidence that she gave, the greatest defense was a life lived in, in, uh, in accordance with what is believed. And so here's things that may be a reminder that we're all called in our own way to be apologists, to be defenders of the faith. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses three to six. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We don't get out spirits, we don't get out guns and swords and things like that to fight. It's casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in readiness and a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. We are in a spiritual warfare. Our weapons are not physical. It's above all the word of God, the sword of the spirit when it's presented. Jude chapter one, verse three, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write to you and to exhort that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's not a thing to sit back. It's not a thing to get into arguments. We recognize in 2 Timothy 2 how a, how a believer should be. The meekness of opposing those that oppose them, instructing those that oppose themselves. But we are recognizing that this is a time of a spiritual battle. Verse, verse 9 of Titus 1, holding faith fast, the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he must be able may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. How important it is to recognize where the real battles are. Christians sometimes are getting involved in politics and in comments about this or that, about vaccines and other things, and they're missing where the real, real battle is. What did he do? Paul had opportunity to, in the Sabbath in Acts 18, Four, and he persuaded, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. Acts 2, 22 to 24, you men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you've taken and by 12 wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that she, that he should be holden of it. Well, um, our presentation is not ourselves. It's presenting Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one approved of God. Um, and yeah, they were going against him, but that's the one we're to put forward 
when we speak to people. Luke 24, 44. And he, he, I said unto them, these are the words which I spake unto you, which I was, when I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which are written in the, in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. One of the greatest evidences of the, that the word of God is the truth is the f- completion of prophecies. A prophet, if he failed in one thing, lost his position as a prophet. But we see the marvel of things that were predicted beforehand, details in the Old Testament, for instance, about the Lord Jesus, about his death, about the, the things that would indicate the, what would Judah and those sort of things, the multitude of prophecies and others that there are. And when we see those that have to be completed up until now and have perfectly been completed, it is one of the things that, that gives evidence uh, to, to someone of the truth of what we believe. Job 38, one to four, and the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words and without knowledge gird up? Now thy loins like a man for I will demand of thee and answer thee. Where wast thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare if thou understanding. Well, the most advanced astronomer can't in the beginning at all say I was there when it happened. But reading the word of God, he can find out. What is the basis of what he studies and sees? We're all called to, in our own way, to be defenders of the faith, the instruction. It doesn't mean that we're going to be a a John Lennox or anything like that. We don't have those abilities, that background or anything, but we are called to to be ready to give an answer, to defend the faith um, and, and understand it. And so just a statement the, the, a reminder I heard one time, a brother, not someone in fellowship with, but actually when we were in Chicago and this man was assuming a position of a, some Christian, a minute, Christian ministry and I turned on actually the, the radio station, the Christian radio station at the time and he, he made a statement that stuck with, he says, there's no time to fight battles where there's not a war. Let's not get off, off track off of what should be, what our focus is, and that is presenting the Lord Jesus Christ as the only and sufficient Savior of sinners. Ephesians 6, 10 to 13. What we saw before, but we'll read it complete more completely. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the ruler of wickedness, wickedness, in high places, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day and having done all to stand. So there is that side of it. But there is also another type of battle or difficulty we face, Second Timothy 2, starting with verse 24. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience, and meekness instructing those that oppose himself, who God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. And they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil or taken captive by him and his will. So a lot of people are not struggling with, with these things. They're just cruising through life, occupied by the daily things. Um, and each one, no matter where their position they're in, their presuppositions, their, their, their battles, their thoughts and everything else, each one needs the savior that we have by God's grace. And so some things to remember in this, just put four of them, Second Timothy 1, 2, know what you believe, right? For the which cause I suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. Remember, time when I was young, Albert Hayhoe comparing, said David took five stones. He had five smooth stones. You only need to use one to to kill Goliath, but he had five stones. And he said, well, do we have five stones, five verses that we could share with people that present the the, the essential things to to know, to believe, the need of recognizing we're sinners, the need of repentance, the need of faith. The other thing, Acts, Luke chapter 2, verse 46, it came to pass after three days, they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. 
many things that go beyond for certain law, put myself first in the list, but each one of us to be able to understand, but we can ask, ask questions. The Lord Jesus, who had perfect and full knowledge, um, the eternal God, he, he asked questions. And, and I remember one time, and I won't stay away from the circumstances that couldn't be identified, was in a circumstance where someone who really didn't have the background was, was sort of arguing with some students who had a lot of science background. And I said, well, I think the best thing is I'm just gonna walk away and not get in the middle of this. It would have been far more useful for the person to have asked questions and try to get into an argument about something that they really didn't have the background to, to discuss in detail. Um, Luke chapter two, verse 47, all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And so it's interesting that here was this 12 year old in the end who was asking questions, but it came back on him. And so he was ready and open to answer people's honest questions. Well, one apologist said what he wanted to do was to give honest answers to honest questions. And so we, we can uh, spend time to, to search these things out to be able to give honest answers. And then it says in Philippians 3.20, for a conversation or citizenship is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. If we try to get people straightened out on what someone might believe in politics or medicine or whatever, if we get off, off track, it's only going to push the person further away. We're not here to make this world a better place. The only thing that really changes this world is when there's a change of heart with a new life in Christ. And so we need to know what we believe. We need to understand the questions can be very useful and powerful. We need to be ready to answer questions that people have of us. And we need to make sure we don't mix up the message that we get off, off track and cause confusion. When Christians, for instance, align behind a, a, a certain political a party or a person or whatever, and maybe that person has good moral principles. Well, that's wonderful. We give thanks for that. But when they align behind that, and then they go to try to talk to someone who has a different alignment, a different feeling, in many cases, they've shut the door down. Yeah. Maybe, maybe the candidate that they would support openly and everything else gets 51% of the vote. But maybe when they talk to people from the other 49%, they've lost their ears. You need to be careful in what we, we do. So this is the last thing, and I'm just going to read a verse, and this is actually from the New Translation. For the word of God is living and operative and sharper than any two-edged sword and penetrating to the vision of soul and spirit, both of joints and marrow, the discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. If you see where there's kind of the red teardrop in the middle of this um, picture from... Um, topographical picture from Google Maps. Korakor is a town, now it's up to red 35,000 in the, in, the, in the Andes in, in Peru. Back a long time ago, December 1978, I visited that town with Doug Buchanan and a brother from Lemo Gokiyama. At that time, if I remember correctly, the, the ride on a small bus was approximately 30 hours. And it was a kind of a milk run. There were times it would stop and sometimes you'd be sitting there in your seat on the bus and there was an animal underneath your, your seat, a lamb in the aisle next to you. Got up into this town and, and there was a small gathering at that time. And we went outside the local like high school and passed out tracks and invited people to come. And several, three students came that evening. Um, this was a time before where a man called Abimel Guzman, philosophy professor, was holding classes at the university. Uh, I wanted, not there, but in, in, up in the mountains in Peru. Um, and teaching dialectic materialism, the, the basis sort of of the communist teaching under actually someone I believe was like a priest, but total Marxist doctrine. That man ended up being the, the, the one who was the strong man in the Shining Path guerrillas, ended up 
uh, finally being caught many years later, but after tens of thousands of deaths, um, he's in life in prison on an island off the coast of Lima, Peru. Well, these young men had been affected by this teaching and when and something that struck me, and I'm gonna finish with this, we could talk to them and they would listen. The minute we read a verse from the word of God or quoted word, of, word for word, a verse from the word of God, they interrupted. I've never seen anything like it bef before or after, but it was under like they were under the power of Satan, demonic type of powers. And it was a showing to me the, the, the fact that the word of God is living and powerful. We see many evidences of it, but they couldn't stop. They couldn't listen. They would interrupt every time. It was a direct quote or direct reading of the word of God. Let's never lose sight of the fact that this book we have is a living and operative book. It's unlike any others. It's the book that judges everything we think, we say. Uh, it's a book that gives us the instructions for life. And it's really the most important tool that, a, if I can put it this way, an apologist has. Yes, wonderful to be able to respond to things in science and other other ways, but never forget that the word of God is living and powerful. And when it's read, when it's spoken, it's different than anything else. And we give thanks to God for it. We'll just pray. Bless